The lady I'm about to introduce has been knighted by the Queen of the Netherlands. She has received Israel's highest civilian award. She has gone through living hell as a prisoner of the Nazis in the dreaded Ravensbrück concentration camp during World War II. That was nearly 30 years ago. She was over 50 years of age when she was arrested for harboring Jews. I won't tell you how old she is, but I do know that she has known Jesus as her Savior for over a half a century. She is truly one of God's most beloved children. I give you Corey Ten Boom. That is true. I was five years old when I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And he came. And he never left me. And that is 75 years ago. <laughs> now you all know how old I am. Uh, you know, I don't know if you have ever had the feeling that your heart was as heavy as a very heavy bag. <laughs> I had that sometimes. And some time ago I had it so bad and then I read in the Bible a text, don't worry over anything whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God which transcends all human understanding, will keep constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. And I, over, I had read that, and then I heard that same text that she said, uh, cast all your cares on at me, the Lord said. And I did it. I don't know if you know that feeling. <sighs> that your heart is so full of burdens. And now I did what the Lord had told me, and I started to cast all the burdens on the Lord. And I said, Lord, here is that, that schedule in uh, America. Lord, <laughs> it is so full, it is so heavy. But you give me strength, Lord, and use me as an, an open channel for streams of living water. Lord, I now pray already for all the people who will be in the meetings. Here they are, Lord. <laughs> then I brought another care. There was a teenager girl. And I thought she was going on with the Lord. And I heard that she did something very stupid and very wrong. And I said, oh, Lord, here she is, that dear... Girl, Mary, you know, Lord, what how stupid she is and what she has done. Oh, Lord, uh, take her, lay your hand on her. And, oh, Lord, I pray for all these many teenagers. Here they are, Lord, and you can, uh, you can reach them, Lord. <laughs> and then <clears throat> I prayed for my impatience. I don't know when you unburden your heart, you will have the same as me, that there comes often a sin that is a burden. And my sin was impatience. Uh, there, is, um, there are very nice Christians who are going to make a movie uh, about, uh, of my book, The Hiding Place. And my, I thought now six weeks is enough to prepare them. <laughs> my impatience, please, will you forgive me? <laughs> and then I brought a whole school of boys that I had heard were in great danger in Africa. And so I went on to bring all my burdens to the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I prayed, and that was good. That is what the Lord has taught us to do. And I will speak about prayer. And this was a very good thing I did, that I said, after bringing all these things to the Lord, Amen. But what I did after my Amen was not good. <laughs> Why did 
you laugh? <laughs> do you know about such stupid praying? <laughs> what did you do this morning? <laughs> did you tell about that problem of the babysitting? <laughs> did you tell everything about your teenagers? Did you tell these, these financial problems? That was good. There is nothing too great for God's power and nothing too small for His love. That was very good that you told everything to the Lord. But what did you do uh, after that? <laughs> How did you come here? With a very heavy heart? Or was it empty? And do you know, when I say that, you understand that I am just as guilty as many of you. But a great joy is that it is the Holy Spirit who teaches us to pray. And he teaches us so to pray that the peace and joy fills our heart after our prayers and we leave the burdens to the Lord. But we cannot do, do that without the Holy Spirit. We need him. But he's willing to help us. And I am so glad that we are in such good company. I read in the, the Bible a text, John 17, 20, where Jesus prayed about 2,000 years ago, I am not praying only for these men here, but for all those who will believe in me through their message that they may all be one. Isn't that tremendous that Jesus has prayed for you and for you and for you and for me? It was 2,000 years ago. For we know the gospel through the people who heard him there and have told it to other people and they told it to other people and so it came to us. Yes, that is, that is a great joy. And you know, uh, when you cast your burden on the Lord, it is not so that you have no, not to think about it anymore, but uh, just when after I had prayed this prayer about a teenager, I uh, saw a book and that was here in the, uh, in the bookstore. Where was the church when the youth exploded? That is from Stuart Briscoe. But not every church was there. And you know, now I will not speak much about this book, but here is an answer. Uh, what we can do with the teenagers. And so, when you cast your burden on the Lord, then the Lord gives you advice. It is, it is not, not uh, a way, it is not gun, it is only in the hands of the Lord. And He has the responsibility. I had some time ago a um, vision. That was also the moment that I was so really burdened. Oh, burdened about uh, what happened in the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain, about the terrible many people who had to, to suffer because they are faithful to the Lord. I heard about Africa that almost 200,000 Christians were killed. You don't know that. The people don't know that. But it happened now. And I, I was, I was so, so burdened. And then uh, I brought, brought it to the Lord. And when I prayed, the Lord gave me a vision. And I had, um, and I have a bag that I have always with me when I travel in the plane. I do put my heavy things in in the books and everything that I need in the uh, airplane. But the Lord said, "Do you see it? It's empty." I said, "Yes, Lord." And the Lord said to me, "You surrendered this morning again." But do you realize that when you surrender to me, that you have no responsibility anymore? I have the responsibility. And what you have, what you possess, you are just a steward, nothing more. For I possess everything and I have the responsibility. And suddenly I what a tremendous joy it is to surrender everything. And then that is not static that you say oh now I have surrendered now there is no power in my life I have nothing to do no it is dynamic because then the burden and all your things that you possess are in the hands of him who carries the responsibility and he is able 
and that is such a joy. And when the Lord said that all to me, it was, oh Lord, what a joy. Oh, let me see you one moment. And the Lord said, look at your left hand. And I saw that in my left hand was another hand. And that hand was pierced. That was Jesus' hand. Oh, what a joy. That is the joy of the surrender and the joy of casting your burdens on the Lord. There's nothing too great for God's power. There's nothing too small for his love. I learned that in that difficult class of life school when I was a prisoner. When you are in a difficult class, then you learn much, especially when the teacher is good. And my teacher was the Holy Spirit. And he taught me so much. And one of the things was about there's nothing too small for God's love. I was a few days in the concentration camp. And I said to my sister, Betsy, I've caught a cold and I have no handkerchief. What must I do? Betsy said, pray. <laughs> I did the same like you. I, uh, I laughed. But she didn't laugh. She followed her hands and she said, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will give Cory a handkerchief she has caught a cold. Amen. <laughs> and she had uh, uh, hardly said Amen. I heard that they called out my name. I went to the window and there stood a friend of mine, a fellow prisoner who works in the hospital. I said, can you come to me? Can you visit me? She said, no, no, I have no time. I just come to bring you a little present. And she gave me a very small package and I opened it and it was a handkerchief. I said, how in the world do you, do, did you know that I needed a handkerchief? She said, I found an old sheet. And I was sewing handkerchiefs from that old sheet. And when I was busy, there was a voice in my heart who said, bring a handkerchief to Corrie and Boom. Can you understand what a handkerchief tells you on such a moment? That there is a Father in heaven who hears it when on a very small planet, the earth, some one of his children prays for the impossible small thing, for a hanky. And that father in heaven tells one of his other children, give a handkerchief to Corrie ten Boom. That is the foolishness of God. <laughs> but the foolishness of God is the greatest wisdom. And I learned so much by, by that handkerchief. Just imagine when your little child or grandchild uh, <coughs> cries because an old doll is broken. <coughs> and she brings that doll to her daddy. And she said, oh, daddy, my doll is broken. What does daddy say? Oh, girl, put it away. That, uh, that doll has not, uh, is not worth a dime. No. Daddy doesn't say that. He said, but that's too bad. Come here, come to Daddy. I will try to mend it. And that grown-up man tries to, to um, uh, he make that, to repair that old doll. How in the world can a grown-up man give so much time and, uh, to an, such a valueless thing as a broken doll? Because he sees it through the eyes of the little one because he loves the little one. And so God sees your problems through your eyes because he loves you. What a joy that we may do intercession. I read in 1 Timothy 2, 2 uh, 1, where Paul says, first, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings should be made on behalf of all men for kings and rulers and positions of responsibility so that our common life may be lived in peace and quiet with a proper sense of God and of our responsibility to him for what we do with our lives. In the sight of God, our Savior, this is undoubtedly the right thing to pray for. I once stood in Vught, the concentration camp in Holland, where Betsy and I were brought before we were sent to the concentration camp Ravensbrück in Germany. 
They had caught us and we had been sent to a place and there we stood just in front of the bunker. The bunker that was a prison inside of the prison camp. Now when they called us out, Betsy and I <coughs> said to each other, Oh, we are free. They will send us home. But when we stood there, we saw that men came and they started to uh, stand beside us. Here were about 10 and here were 15 men. And suddenly we saw that the guards had gone away. And a man uh, called, Is there not anyone here who can pray? And that she said, Yes, I can pray. But why do you ask that? Is it not that we are sent home? He said, Sent home? This means that perhaps all of us will go into that building and be shot. Oh, yes, that she said, I can pray. And she folded her hands and she prayed for all these men who, he were, who were standing beside her. And it was such a beautiful prayer. And then she started to sing that the thing great of Jesus, of his power, love, and might. I don't know what has happened with these men. Betsy and I were sent to another part of the concentration camp and later to Ravensbrück. But do you know that when that man shouted, Oh, is there not one who can pray? That this was a cry of the world of today. There are so many people who need your intercession. And do you know that Isaiah, in Isaiah we read, that God wondered because there was no intercessor. So important is intercession. And it is a great joy to pray for other people, to bring them to the Lord. No, when you are an intercessor, and I hope you all are, or you will become one after the Lord has told you what it means that we are called to be intercessors, and he wonders when there are no intercessors. It's so important for him. Why is that so? Does the Lord need intercessors? Yes. That is the way. He has, he is working. He is working through you and me as intercessors. And I, well, Ellen and I were in Cuba once, and it was a very dangerous and difficult time. And when it is very dangerous and difficult, then uh, we always pray, Lord, tell my friends to pray for us. And the Lord does. And we came in Holland, and there was a girl who was really... Now, you could say backwarded, a little bit fever-minded, but she loved the Lord, and the Lord loved her. And uh, when we came to, to a group of Christians to tell what we had at that experience, she said, Tante, that is auntie, uh, Tante, uh, the 10th of April, you were in great danger, weren't you? I said, yes. How did you know that? She said, in the midst of the night. Suddenly, the Lord awakened me and said, pray for Tom the Curry and for Ellen. And she said, then I did it. Now, do you see what a joy it is to be an intercessor? That girl heard the voice of the Lord, and that is a, jo a great joy to hear his voice. And when you are an intercessor, you stand together with the Lord. We must understand that praying means to bring our unability into the, the realm of the ability of God. And that is so great because his answers are the greatest reality. I once spoke for a huge group in, um, in a church in Australia. And I had spoken about a text where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I come in. And after I got through, I gave an invitation, but it was a very full church, so I said, People, when you have asked Jesus to come into your heart, or you are willing to do it, then we are very happy to help you with literature and prayer and advice when there are difficulties. So then just come into the room behind the altar. And there you will find counselors. 
The first who came were two very tiny children. They had not understood about that room behind the altar, so they stood in front of me. And one said, am I too little to, <laughs> to ask Jesus to come into my heart? I said, no. Jesus is interested even in sparrows, and you are far bigger than a sparrow. <laughs> and then that little girl followed her hands, and the whole of the church was dead silent. She, they heard what she said. He said, uh, Jesus, I have been very naughty. Will you come into my heart, and will you make it clean with your blood? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and Jesus came. Just like he comes in your heart. Perhaps some of you have never done it before. And when you do it now, then he comes. But sometimes we who have done it already, Jesus stands outside and he knocks again. And when we say, yes, Lord, come in, then he comes. I said to that other little girl, do you do the same? She said, I did it three weeks ago. <laughs> And after that, I have prayed every day for Betty. And now Betty had done it. I said, then I have something, a, a very good task for you. You together must pray for a third little girl. Someone who doesn't know the Lord. And they looked at each other, and the same moment, they said, uh, Anna. I said, that must be Anna. And, <laughs> And they promised they would pray for Anna till Anna had uh, also prayed, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And then after, they, pray, they said, then we will pray with Anna together for a fourth girl. And when that fourth girl has accepted the Lord, we will pray for the fifth girl. And so on. The chain reaction of the intercession in the heart of two little girls. And this chain reaction can come into your heart, all of you. When you, when you start to pray for that man, for that woman, for that girl, for that boy, and when you pray that the Lord will touch him or her, and you go to that person for whom you have prayed, and you tell them about the Lord Jesus, how Jesus has said, Come unto me all, all. I will give you rest. And when you tell that, then the Lord will use your prayer and your, your words to save that person for eternity. And then, that's not the only thing which you can go to that person and say, well, we pray for a third one, and then with three for a fourth one, and then with four for a fifth one. The chain reaction of the intercession can start in your heart when you are willing to surrender. And what a joy is it. And the Lord will enjoy it. He wonders when there is no intercession. He rejoices when there is an intercession. There is nothing too great for God's power. <laughs> Some time ago I was in Formosa. And I had to, to order a plane ticket, a rather expensive one. Now, the Lord told me very clear uh, what, uh, what I should uh, order. Now, the good thing is that I, am, um, I have never to worry about money because my treasurer is very rich. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how rich? He has the cattle on thousand hills, and that's very much. <clears throat> and when I need money, I always say, Lord, I think you must sell some cows and give me the money. <laughs> and he does. He always does. Sometimes he waits till the last moment when it comes. So, I, without fear, I went to that uh, office of the airplane and I said, Lady, will you uh, order a plane ticket for me, but write it down for it is rather much. And she wrote down. I said, for Mosa, Sydney, Australia, then um, Auckland, or New Zealand, then Sydney, Australia, then Cape Town, South Africa, then Tel Aviv, Israel, Amsterdam, Holland. And she wrote it all down and she said, what is your end destination? I said, heaven. <laughs> Face. 
places that I see because you know that your end destination is heaven. But that lady uh, did not understand it and she said, how do you write that? I said, H-E-A-P-E-N. And she wrote under Amsterdam, H-E-A-P-E-N. Oh, oh, she said, I didn't mean that. I said, but I meant it. Yeah, but you have not to write it down. I have my ticket already. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? I said, about 2,000 years ago, there was one who ordered my ticket for heaven. And the only thing I had to do was to receive it from him. And that was Jesus Christ. When he died at the cross to carry my punishment, and he made it all right, and when I told her about that, a man who was uh, sitting there in the office turned around and he said, Lady, that is true. <laughs> I said, So, uh, do you know that? Have you a reservation for the house of the Father for heaven? He said, Sure, Lady, I have my reservation. I have received Jesus as my Savior. And he has made me a child of God. And a child of God has a reservation in the come to us or come to her there are many people here who know that they uh, have a reservation in heaven do you know why? because they have the word of God and in this word of God you can find how to get a reservation for the house of the father those who believe in the name of the son of God Jesus can know that they have everlasting life so when you are not quite sure, talk with that one who knows the Lord, or talk with us. But don't go to sleep tonight before you have come to Jesus, for that is what we will help you with, and that's what the Bible says. Jesus has come unto me all, and that's also you, and I will give you peace and rest and eternal life. And Jesus never fails. <coughs> I was so happy when I got the, play, the ticket for the plane because one day before I had to pay it, the money was there. I just told my uh, treasurer there. And you can understand how happy I was with that ticket. And I just was looking, yes, for Mosa, Sydney, Sydney, uh, Auckland, Auckland, Sydney, Sydney, Tel Aviv. No. Then... Cape Town, South Africa. I hadn't ordered that. I had ordered first Cape Town and then Tel Aviv. So I went to the telephone. I said, lady, um, you made a mistake. You have changed my schedule. And my boss has told me that I must go first to South Africa and then to Israel. And you may not change that. She said, lady, that is not possible. There is not a direct airline uh, from Australia to, New, uh, to South Africa. You must go first to Israel. I said, why, why not? She said, oh, there are no islands in the Indian Ocean for the landings in between. I said, all right, lady, then we must pray that God will give an island in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> for the one who has told me to make this, uh, this trip, that is God. And I have to obey him. An hour later, she called me. She said, lady, have you prayed for an island in the Indian Ocean? <laughs> She said, we have just got a telegram from the Qantas that they have bought the Cocos Island and now there's a direct <laughs> <laughs> line from Australia to South Africa. <laughs> Isn't it exciting? <laughs> Isn't it a joy to go to side by side with him who has all power? Oh, what a joy. Yes, we have nothing to fear. And you know, I like so to pray with an open Bible. I don't know if you do it. I like so to say, Father, you have said in your word. Now you must do it. <laughs> and God likes it. <laughs> For God has meant all the promises of the Bible. All. And he likes it when we mean business with his promises. I was for the first time in uh, Russia. And I had a red suitcase many Russian Bibles. And now I was in Moscow and I saw how the uh, custom officer ransacked every uh, suitcase. 
my suitcase stood all at the end. I, I got scared. I thought, my, what will he do when he finds my these Russian Bible that's forbidden? Send me to, to prison, send me back to Holland. Of course, he will take away the, the Bibles. I said, oh, Lord, Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, Lord, you have said in Jeremiah 1, God watches over his word to perform it. Now, Lord, this, these Bibles in my suitcase that your word. So now, with my hand on Jeremiah 1, I pray, will you watch over your word, my Bibles, that is your word, Lord, you my Bibles, to smuggle them. <laughs> but that, that's not what Jeremiah has said. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You know. I found out that we can pray with an open Bible, and God does not ask first, have you a very sound exegesis? Otherwise, I do not listen. Oh, no. God sees the heart. And do you know, the same moment that I prayed it, I saw around my suitcase light beings. It was the first and the only time in my life that I have seen angels. Why? I was so glad to see that. And uh, my whole fear dis disappeared. I was not afraid anymore. And at last a man came to my uh, suitcase and uh, he said, uh, is that your suitcase, lady? Yes, sir. He said, that's a heavy one. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, wait a moment. I'm through with my work. I will help you. And he took my suitcase <laughs> and brought it to, my, to the car of the interest <laughs> who was waiting for me. My, I can tell you almost I had shouted hallelujah. <laughs> You know, there's nothing too great for God's power. What a joy. Saying that is your Father, your Heavenly Father who loves you. And does not say, oh, sometimes you may pray and do intercession. No. He loves it when you pray and when you ask much. He, is, he wonders when there's no intercessor. What a joy to have such a Father, Heavenly Father. Oh, and the best is not is yet to be. <laughs> what a joy. <laughs> yes, we must uh, tell everything to the Lord. Also our blunders. <laughs> and you also, when you, when you have done a blunder, you can feel so unhappy. Huh? Oh, I can almost hate myself for stupid Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I learned a very good illustration. And uh, a visitor came to a weaver school. And he saw how all these students made beautiful weavings. And he said, see, he asked one of the students, what must you do when you make a mistake? Must you cut it out or start from the beginning? And the student said, no. Our teacher is such a great um, artist that when we make a mistake, he uses that mistake to improve the beauty of the pattern. And that is what the Lord does. We must just tell the Lord our blunder, and you never know what he does with your blunder. I was in, in uh, Japan, and I had a difficulty that I thought, oh, oh, there were perhaps eight different Japanese, but uh, further all were the same. There was Mr. Sekia, and there were three Mr. Sekia, and there six. <laughs> <laughs> now that is only the first month that you are and they say when the Japanese comes here uh, he thinks that we are all the same <laughs> but now I had a difficulty with it was once I was speaking for students and there came a late comer and I thought oh, oh yeah that's the director of the Christian seminary so when I was through with my talk I said and would you be so kind to close this meeting with a word of prayer <laughs> that man looked at me and said I I've never prayed in my life. <laughs> that is not the di director of the seminary. That is the professor of that non-Christian university. I said, oh, professor doesn't matter. But uh, so I, I will pray and I pray. But oh, the Japanese are very, very uh, polite. He came uh, to me after the meeting and bowed several times, very deep. 
And he said, I was so sorry that I could not do what you asked me, but I had never prayed before. I said, Professor, I honor you that you didn't do it. If you had been superficial, you should perhaps have say, said a prayer without believing it. But I'm very glad that you didn't do it. But tell me, Professor, why are you not a Christian? He said, I? Oh, no, then first I must study Christianity. I said, no, sir. In this book is not written, those who have studied Christianity get the power to become a child of God, but those who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he gives them the power to become a child of God. And I prayed with him, and after half an hour, that professor made a decision for Jesus that did the angel rejoice. <laughs> How good. Do you see my blunder? The Lord used to improve the, pattern, the beauty of the pattern. I'm so glad that we can tell everything to the Lord. Now, it is true, sometimes God gives the no answer. I could speak about hours and hours about the, the answers, the yes answer that I've experienced. Sometimes God says no. I was in, in solitary confinement, alone in a cell, for a month. But I was still in Holland. And I prayed every day, oh, Lord, let the enemy never bring me to a concentration camp in Germany. And God gave the no answer. He allowed that the Germans brought Betsy and me to that terrible concentration camp Ravensbrück. And I could not understand why God had not answered our prayers. But now I understand it. I understood it earlier. I remember that Betsy had died and a week later I was set free and I stood before the gate of Ravensbrück. When that gate should open, I could go home. When I stood there waiting, there came a friend of mine and said, Corrie, I must tell you something. <laughs> Mrs. Was and Mrs. De Moye both died today. And then I looked for the last time at the cruel camp. And I said, Lord, if it had been only for these two, from whom I know that you have used Betsy and me to bring them to you, Lord, for both have accepted you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior. Lord, if it had been only for those two, but there are many more, it has been all worthwhile all our suffering, even Betsy's death, to be used to save souls for eternity is worthwhile to suffer even to die. I saw God's side of the pattern. You know, I like that, that um, little poem that you have in your country. My life is like a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He works steadily. Oft times he weaves sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget. He sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hands than the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. No, it is so good to know that God never makes a mistake. Once we will understand that when we are in heaven, but now already we can know very much through the word of God. And this book shows us that God has no problems with the world and with your and my life. God has no problems, only plans. There's never a panic in heaven. And the thing that you and I must do is look in the right direction. Look unto Jesus. So often people say to me, Oh, but Corrie, you have such a great faith. But I have not a great faith. I have a small faith, but it is a faith in a great God. <laughs> and it uh, is not written in the Bible, let us look unto our faith. In Hebrew 12 it said, Let us look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. 
look at Jesus and be at rest. I had a jewelry store before the war. Sometimes I had a new watch in my store that did not run well. I never repaired it, but I sent it back to the manufacturer. I wrote him a letter, <coughs> that new watch doesn't run well. Will you repair it? After the manufacturer had repaired such a watch, then it went always absolute exact. When my face doesn't work, I don't try to repair it. I sent it back to the manufacturer. <laughs> Jesus, the author and the finisher, the manufacturer of my face. And when Jesus repairs it, then it works. <laughs> so don't look into your face, but unto Jesus. <clears throat> what a joy is it that we can and may and must cast our burdens on the Lord. And he listens. But we have to surrender. You know, there are sometimes people who say to me, I know that we are called to be channels of streams of living water, but I did not experience living water flow through me on the thirsty world of today. You know, perhaps I hear some of the people who say, uh, I, have, I have not experienced that the living water has streamed through me these last weeks. Then I must ask you a question. Just imagine this glass. When I put water, when I put, keep the uh, glass downwards and I throw water over it, it doesn't come in, anything in it. Of course not, when, when it is upside down. Did you think that when your heart was turned towards the world that there could be streams of living water flowing through you? Of course not. But you are not people who are turned towards the world, otherwise you shouldn't be here. No. Are you 50-50? 50% turned towards the world and 50% turned to God? Now look what happens. Nothing comes in and nothing comes out. Now, I know many of you after these few, uh, few days, and I know that many people here have surrendered far more than 50%. How are you? 90% turn towards God, and only 10% turn towards the world? Now, look what happens. <clears throat> yes, water comes in, and water comes out at one side. Only when I keep the glass 100% upwards, now look, now at all sides it streams over. Do you understand it? What are you? You are not turned towards the world, are you? You are not only 50% turned towards God. Are you 90, 99% turned towards God? Only 1% to, to the world? Do you know that in the Bible is a text? The eyes of the Lord go to and fro the whole world to strengthen him whose heart is fully turned towards him. And the eyes of the Lord go through this room and through your room to fill with his Holy Spirit who will surrender 100% to him everything. And you are bought with a very high price, his precious blood. Will you give him his money's worth? He has a legal right to have you 100%. Lock, stock and barrel. Will you surrender all? And the Lord will make you a channel of streams of living water in this very, very uh, thirsty world. What a joy. The Lord will use you. And never, never are afraid that the Lord does not hear your prayer. I must tell you one little story that I forgot now to tell. I saw, when I was five years old, I told you that I had asked Jesus to come into my heart. 
and Jesus came. And immediately the Lord made me an intercessor. My mom told me later, oh Corrie, as small as you were, only five years old, you were an intercessor. For every little prayer that you said ended with the word, and Lord, will you save all the people in the Smedestraat. Now the Smedestraat was a street behind our house where were many pubs, and you saw all the drunken people there. And the five years old had a burden for these drunken people, and I prayed for them. You smile when you think of a five years old who prays for a whole street. But the Lord did not smile. He smiled. But he enjoyed it. For do you know what happened? Some time ago, I could suddenly speak for a TV in Holland. And that was... Uh, I, I reached many people. And someone wrote me, my husband was so happy that uh, he, he heard that you came from Harlem. He also comes from Harlem. And he has lived 17 years in the Smedestraat. <laughs> and I can tell you that he too loves the Lord Jesus now. I said, thank you, Lord. An answer for a prayer of 75 years ago. A five-year-old prayed for Wall Street. Seventy-five years later, he heard the answer. And you are praying for, for some people, and the devil has told you several times, stop it, it, it takes such a long time. Don't you see that God doesn't answer your prayer? He is a liar. There is not one of your prayers that the Lord did not hear. Once in heaven, we will see that every prayer was heard. We will praise him for every answered and so-called unanswered prayer. For we will see God's side and the unanswered prayers and the prayers that take a long time are not unanswered. For the Lord is praying together with you for that person. And you too will win. Jesus and you. And I could tell you for that same TV program that I heard answers for people for whom I had prayed 60 years ago, 45 years ago, and 53, uh, uh, 35 years ago. It was just as if the Lord said, you must just see that sometimes God's mills go slowly, but they go very secure. And now I will just end with this little poem. Jesus heard when you prayed last night, he talked with God about you. Jesus was there when you fought your fight. He is going to bring you through. Jesus knew when you shed those tears, so you did not weep alone for the burden. You thought too heavy to bear, he made it his very own. Jesus himself was touched by that trial which you could not understand. Jesus stood by as you almost fell and lovingly grasped your hand. Jesus cared when you bore that pain indeed. He bore it too. He felt each pang, each ache in your heart because of his love for you. Jesus was grieved when you doubted his love, but he gave you grace to go on. Jesus rejoiced as you trusted him, the most trustworthy one. His presence shall ever be with you. No need to be anxious or fret. Wonderful Lord, he was there all the time. He has never forsaken you yet. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it is more true than we can grasp. Thank you that you will make us intercessors. That you will stand beside us and pray with us for the other people. Thank you that you have prayed for us. Thank you that you are willing to answer our prayers and sometimes answer it with no, but that you never make a mistake. 
We praise and thank you, Lord. And now, Lord, listen, who of us say now, I surrender all, not 90, not 99 percent, but 100 percent, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Hallelujah. Amen.